Kia ora everyone and welcome to Worship at St. Mary by the Sea today. Our theme for Advent is from generation to generation. And today's theme is God meets us in our fear. Uh, many of us live with fear, grief and difficult situations that impact on our lives. And today through Isaiah and the Gospel of Luke, we explore what it means when God says, Do not be afraid. If you have a celebration or a milestone you'd like to share with us, please email office at stmary.co.nz and we'd love to be able to include it. We light now the second candle of Advent. Over a hundred people from the ages of two to eighty year olds were asked the question, what are you afraid of? From the voices of the different generations, hear these answers. Not being enough. Not making enough of a difference. Falling down. That we forget that we belong to one another. Climate change. My child having to learn gun violence drills at school. Spiders. Not having someone to take care of me. Not having someone who knows my stories. My mental health slipping. Ending up alone. Nightmares. Stopping short of following God all the way. Today we light the candle of peace because we so desperately need God's peace in the midst of all we fear. May this light be a reminder that Christ is coming. God was with the generations before. God is with us today and God will be with us tomorrow. Even now, God is on the way. Amen. Fear can be a good thing. It can help us be attentive while driving down the motorway. It can alert us to possible accidents. It can motivate us to do our best. However, fear can also be harmful. For so many of us, fear of the other, fear of failure, or fear of the unknown has led us to make sinful choices in our lives. Choices such as building walls, or tearing others down. 
Today, in our confession, we ask for mercy and pray for guidance. As we confess, we come before an entirely merciful and loving God who says to us, Do not be afraid. Let us pray. Patient God, you know just how often we make decisions from a place of fear rather than love. You know just how often we allow fear to take the place of logic, fanning unhealthy fires in our lives. You know just how often we tuck your words, do not be afraid, onto dusty shelves and in the back of closets, stubbornly holding on to our own point of view. Forgive us for giving fear the microphone. Silence the voices of scarcity, shame and rejection, which spark and feed so much of our fear. To recenter us in love, with hope we pray. Amen. Family of faith, even when we forget God's words, God does not forget us. Even when we lose our way, God does not lose us. Even when we fall, fall short or make mistakes, God forgives and holds us. We are known, forgiven and loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 to 10 Like a branch that sprouts from stump, someone from David's family will someday be king. The Spirit of the Lord will be with him to give him understanding, wisdom, and insight. He will be powerful, and he will know and honor the Lord. His greatest joy will be to obey the Lord. This king won't judge by appearances or listen to rumors. The poor and the needy will be treated with fairness and with justice. His words will be law everywhere in the land, and criminals will be put to death. Honesty and fairness will be his royal robes. Leopards will lie down with young goats and wolves will rest with lambs. Calves and lions will eat together and be cared for by little children. Cows and bears will share the same pasture. The young will rest side by side. Lions and ox will both eat straw. Little children will play in their snake holes. This they will stick their hands into the dens of poisonous snakes and never be hurt. Nothing harmful will take place on the Lord's holy man mountain. Just as water fills the sea, the land will be filled with people who know and honour the Lord. The time is coming when one of David's descendants will be a signal for the people of all nations to come together. They will follow his advice and his own nation will become famous. This picture is called Ancestral by Hannah Garrity, inspired by Isaiah 11, 1 to 10, and it's paper lace with watercolour. Hannah writes, This illustration explores the idea that perhaps the oppressor is not so far away. The lion and the calf, the cheetah and the goat, the wolf and the lamb, the ox and the bear. Each predator shares a face with its prey. Each pair of animal faces is connected to the root line of the stump of Jesse. Each generation has been challenged to forward the radical call for peace in this Isaiah text. As I read this text, I was drawn mostly to the idea of roots, the past history, the ancient text from the ancient times expressing the human condition and its possibilities. The practices of culturally responsive teaching and critical race theory come to mind for me, a public school teacher in Virginia. Our governor recently won an election by using the acronym CRT as a wedge in our electorate. He stoked fears. Immediately upon his inauguration, he began to defund public education through executive order. This is racist and oppressive policy that plays on white fear. Make no mistake. By contrast, what is really happening in Virginia public schools is quite the opposite. Honouring the wisdom and the ways of multicultural ancestry is the basis of how my classroom operates. In practice, culturally responsive teaching is an incredibly powerful way to address systemic oppression in education. My white skin represents the oppression of centuries. With a culturally responsive approach, I can lead with love. I can honour each student's ancestry, lived experience and daily presence in my classroom. 
Hannah continues. As a result of these conflicting forces, this year has both been the crown jewel and most difficult of my career. It is the first year I've taught as a fully trained, culturally responsive teacher. There are so many things I did not get to apply, so many ways that my practice can evolve, yet it's incredible to see how my students are thriving. Critical race theory is not the same concept as culturally responsive teaching, although they have the same acronym. Systemic oppression and racism are very real, and critical race theories explores that fact. Culturally responsive teaching is a humanizing approach that allows for the boundaries of culture to meld, firmly giving way to the incredible curriculum access for all students, regardless of their backgrounds. As I walk in each day as the face of oppression, the world arrives too. My school has 48 languages spoken. We have many recent immigrants. I have a new student added to one of my classes once every couple of weeks. The only way to connect across barriers is to remove barriers with honour and reverence for the collective wisdom of humanity. Culturally responsive teaching creates that space. Perhaps the asp and the adder not injuring the child and the infant are a metaphor for this. In this image, the child and infant are represented by the roots. So the viper represents the asp and the adder. The threat looms, yet the roots thrive and sprouts emerge from the stump. The prey and the predator are on equal terms. No longer is one superior to the other. We must humanise one another. We must honour each other's ancestry. In this young moment of my 17th year as a teacher, I have seen the magic, the power and the incredible way that this practice, culturally responsive teaching, transform my ancestral presentation as the face of oppression. I led with love this year. The fear has washed away. And that was Anna Garrity, Hannah Garrity. A reading from Luke 1, verses 26 to 38. One month later, God sent the angel Gabriel to the town of Nazareth in Galilee with a message for a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to Joseph from the family of King David. The angel greeted Mary and said, You are truly blessed. The Lord is with you. Mary was confused by the angel's words and wondered what they meant. Then the angel told Mary, Don't be afraid. God is pleased with you, and you will have a son. His name will be Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of God Most High. The Lord God will make him king as his ancestor David was. He will rule the people of Israel forever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, How can this happen? I'm not even married. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come down to you, and God's power will come over you. So your child will be called the Holy Son of God. Your relative Elizabeth is also going to have a child, even though she is old. No one thought she could ever have a baby, but in three months she will have a son. Nothing is impossible for God. Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it happen as you have said. And the angel left her. This piece is called Mary's Golden Annunciation by Kamel Bukelin. Inspired by Luke 1, 26-38, it is acrylic, gilding paint, canvas collage, on handmade reclaimed paper. Mary's Golden Annunciation explores the moment of encounter between Mary and the angelic messenger. This unusual encounter may have been startling to young Mary, a soon-to-be teen bride turned possibly unwed mother. Yet with holy bravery in the face of communal isolation, she accepts the call to be a surrogate mother to a son who is to be the saviour of her people and the son of God. There is not much commentary regarding Mary's consent to motherhood. She is often portrayed as humble yet passive, acceptor of a fate predestined for her. But I wonder, what if the angel had appeared to Mary and she had declined? Would her name be erased from historic and religious memory in favour of another willingly young virgin? Mary's golden annunciation depicts not only a remarkable encounter, but also the moment that divinity in human form was disconceived. It is my speculation that the divinity of God entered Mary's body no sooner than Mary's yes went out of her mouth. In a time when women have few options other than marriage, Mary's consent to a potentially unwed motherhood is a brave act of subversive agency. Mary's yes, uttered in her magnificate, we see the transformation of a young teenage girl from fearful to determined, from simply accepting to deciding, from passivity to agency, from betrothed to surrogate mother of God, 
an honour rarer than gold. Perhaps the most remarkable enunciation in this passage is not the message's revelation to Mary, but Mary's yes to the call. The vicarage has a nice outdoors area. It has this great cobblestone courtyard. But amongst these cobblestones are constant weeds. We dig them out, but they keep coming back. Some things, no matter what you do to them, they grow back. And for some things, it doesn't matter whether they're weeds or trees. I remember a time when we were studying at St John's College. We came home one day and the college gardener had been in and he cut out everything from our garden. Every plant was removed. Trees, bushes, flowers and roses. I guess as a landlord that's your prerogative. Though as a tenant, so to speak, I was annoyed. I thought it poetic justice when one year later that rose bush sprouted new growth. The rose bush was just a flat stump, level with the ground. But out of that stump sprouted a new branch. And there was new hope, new flowers. For those of us that watch nature, we see how that if things are left alone, they will regenerate. And our reading from Isaiah looks to that regeneration. It talks of God's new life, God's new way, coming from the stump of Jesse. Jesse is the family line of Jesus. And Isaiah prophesies that a person will come out of the family line of Jesse that will renew and regenerate God's people. Something good, something new, can come from what people have forgotten about. And there is hope. This week in the fatal stabbing of the dairy worker Janak Patel, the debate about punishment versus re rehabilitation was reignited by our political parties. And into this debate, offering the voice of hope, is Tefang Nye's trust co-founder Adrian Dalton, who talks of providing an opportunity to learn a trade to learn how to garden in Miranda, where their solution is respect rather than retribution. In a native plant nursery and a training centre, people learn new skills. That centre welcomes people from all walks of life to learn those skills and to get paid while they do it. Adrian and the trust story of giving people skills and respect is demonstrated as she collects people for work and helps them to get the skills that they need to help themselves and Aotearoa. She is, and the trust are, hope bearers, shining the light of love rather than fear. Our gospel story today gives us a window through which to view difficult situations. When the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, she is perplexed and confused, and no doubt afraid. Yet the angel's news is, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid? We hear this refrain throughout the Christmas story. It's also one of the most common phrases in the Bible. Depending on how you count it, you might come up with it 200 times. Or you might come up with it 300 times. From generation to generation, God shows up in the midst of our fear and uncertainty and confusion and says, do not be afraid. From generation to generation, faithful people have said yes, despite their apprehension. And whether that's Adrian helping people to learn new skills in Miranda, or whether it's Mary saying yes to God's plans. From generation to generation, our ancestors in faith have accepted the invitation. The prophecy in Isaiah paints a vision of what we work towards when we say yes. A vision of righteousness and equity. A vision of walls 
living with lambs. No harm or hurt shall destroy the earth, and a child shall lead the way we hear. It is a way of peace. Yet living this way of do not be afraid is not easy. Or at least it's not easy when it impacts on you. It's fine when it's a story. But when you have to live it, it jars. The story of the angel coming to Mary has disparity. As the saying goes, in the history of calming down, never has a person calmed down when told to calm down. The angel's exclamation that Mary should not be afraid is terribly unrealistic. People have been afraid in far less tenuous circumstances. How could Mary not have felt fear when confronted with the celestial being, telling her she's going to be pregnant outside of marriage, when in those days that led to death by stoning? How could she avoid feeling afraid after that? After hearing the angel's message about her pregnancy? Later Mary's son Jesus also felt fear at Gethsemane when faced with betrayal and capital punishment. As she watched him suffer and die, what fear and anguish she must have felt. Some theologians try to explain the disparity between the command to put away fear and what comes later in the story. But what if the disparity is what we are meant to sit with? This same disparity is part of many people's stories. Every day people are faced with untold grief and pain, and the gospel or the good news is not enough to fully take away that pain and fear. Hope can sound hollow, to those who are enduring the difficult parts of life. Rather than quickly moving to try and figure out God's plan in our pain and fear, maybe we need to sit with it for a bit, rather than gloss over the disparity. Can we sit with Mary? Yes, her song later marks her courage and bravery, but we all know that courage rises despite our fear, not in the absence of fear. How much courage did Mary need in that moment? Was that her own courage from deep within? Or was that courage given to her from the Holy Spirit? In a similar way to how Paul describes that peace that passes all understanding. Perhaps this story and the disparity of the angel's commands are an invitation to sit with those who are experiencing the disparity of a world moving on, despite their personal struggle. A world that says, cheer up, move on, while they're still grieving. Perhaps the disparity of Mary's story invites us to accompany people moving through their pain as Mary and Jesus accompanied one another through life's events, events that only the two of them understood. Despite the disparity, they move through that transitional and liminal space, their tender lives together. In other words, God moved through the liminal and tender space of God's human life with Mary, even as they were both afraid. This week, we hear the hope from Isaiah of new life, from things we think have died. We hear, do not be afraid, and we realise that this isn't realistic, and that instead, God meets us in our fear, and journeys with us through it. Do not be afraid, comes with God's presence and company. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for the way you journey with us. 
we thank you for life's experiences that you've been through. We know that as you journey with us, you have experienced all that we experience. May the Holy Spirit bring us peace so that we know that we are not alone. In your name we pray. We believe in a God who knows our fears. We believe in a God who says, be not afraid. We believe in a God who kicks off her shoes and wades into the muck of our lives with us. We believe in a God who stitches herself to our heels and invites us to dance. We believe in a God who hint stars into the night sky so that we can find our way home and who sends us friends with open doors so we can find our way to love. We believe in a God who finds us in our fear and does not leave us alone. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen.
Holy God, we take a deep breath in and know that you are here. For where two or more are gathered, you are there. You never leave our sides. Like a protective mother hen or the sun who circles the earth, you carry us with you. So today we bow our heads with tender spirits and ask that once more you would lean in close. Hear our prayers. Boy our hearts. Send your spirit rushing through us like a mighty wind. For these days, God, we have much to fear. We fear the return of the COVID variant that could once again shut down the world. We fear the rising tide of violence. We fear global warming. Will our grandchildren have trees to climb? We look at our lives and are afraid that we aren't making much of a difference. That we might be forgotten at the end of the day. We fear rejection, we fear grief, we fear not being enough. Holy God, the muck of our lives is deep. At times it feels like we're swimming in it. And so we come to you today because you are a God who said, Do not fear. 365 times in scripture, once for every day. You are a God who has inserted yourself into the corners of our lives, refusing to let us go, refusing to leave us alone. And so we rest in that. We empty our pockets of our fears and give them to you, trusting that you will hold them tenderly, just as you hold us. You whisper, do not be afraid. You promise to never leave our side. You call us beloved. May that be enough for today, and now with hope in our hearts, we pray the words your Son taught us to pray, saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
as you leave, may you go knowing that from generation to generation, we have been claimed and loved. From generation to generation, God has been by our side. From generation to generation, we are not alone. The God of yesterday, the God of tomorrow, knows you by name, loves you and calls you forth, saying, Go, be the person you are called to be, love wildly, do justice and come back soon. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>